Well, I, <clears throat> I want to give you my formal greeting in just a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. But first of all, a couple of things. Uh, first, happy Father's Day uh, to you who are fathers, to join Joy and her greeting to you. You know, I've never envied people who have a big handicap in golf or in their physical bodies, but I have envied people who have handicap tags on their cars. Problem is, you can't have one without the other. Well, I have both. And that's just a long way around the saying that I look forward to greeting you after the service, but I won't be able to make it to the back very easily, so I'm going to greet you in the side door by the baptismal font, if that's okay with you. I want to read the passage from Luke 15 that Joy just spoke about with the children, beginning at verse 11, and that's in 1112 in your pew Bible, page 1112. Luke 15, beginning at verse 11. Then Jesus said, <clears throat> There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the son, to the slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the elder son was in the, in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked him what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father and said, listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you. And I've never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> you cannot know how privileged I am to be with you today. I'm honored, I'm humbled. The last time I spoke in this chancel area, I said only a few words, but they were very weighty words, especially two of them, I do with what those words were. <laughs> Almost exactly 59 years ago, my wife and I were married right here on a Tuesday afternoon. We celebrated our anniversary last week. And congratulations to the boys who uh, 
I see in the bulletin, and I, I talk with Pat and Charlie, and these beautiful flowers are celebrating their 59th. Their anniversary was, is on the 8th, ours is on the 10th. Uh, so this is a special place for me, and incidentally, for some other words spoken here too. As I think back on sermons that I heard from the pulpits of churches in Augusta as I grew up, the only words I can recall are words from this pulpit. I don't remember who the preacher was at that time. I was just visiting. But I was uh, going through a downtime in my life, and the words picked me up. He said something to the effect that if you are feeling far from God and your spirit is down, reach out to help someone else, and it will be a tonic for your soul. He was right on. I've never forgotten that. It was a word from God for me that day. My prayer is that the same thing will happen today, that there'll be something here for you in this worship service that will be an encouragement, a challenge, a comfort, something that will refresh your life in Christ. I'm sure that Matt Rich, who will celebrate his fourth year with you this coming week, I'm sure that's the kind of prayer he has every Sunday on his heart. Well, probably most of us could tell by heart the story we just read a moment ago. Probably not as well as Joy has done it this morning with the kids. But chapter 15 in Luke, the, prodigal, the parable of the prodigal son. It may be the most well-known story in the Bible. Some say it's the greatest short story that has ever been written. As we look at this parable together, there are two disclaimers, for want of a better word, that I think are appropriate to keep in mind. The first has to do with the primary focus of this story that Jesus told. What is that focus? It would certainly seem to be the young son who in the worst way squandered his inheritance, then filled with deep regret and, and no doubt fear, practically crawls home only to find a gracious and forgiving father. Many classical artists have put this story on canvas. The most famous, no doubt, is the painting by the Dutch artist Rembrandt, entitled aptly, The Return of the Prodigal Son. We're told that Rembrandt was so moved by this story that he made sketches for over 30 years before he felt equipped to do his masterpiece. The painting is said by several critics to be the greatest picture ever painted by anybody anywhere. One time, Henry Nouwen, the celebrated Catholic theologian and writer, he stumbled on a reproduction of this painting. He was so awestruck by the emotion Rembrandt captured that he was inspired to write a book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, one of Nouwen's most powerful writings. There's no question that for all of us, the weight of this story is centered on the young man who returned home from a far country. Every time I read the story and come to those words where it says, he arose and came to his father, I hurry to read ahead where it says, as soon as his father saw him, his father from the distance ran and, and hugged his son and kissed him. I hurry to read it because it seems like the father's actions are almost overblown. They're too intense. It's too extravagant. It's too good to be true. I want to be sure those words are still there, and of course they always are still there. How lavish is the Father's love. This Father is unbelievable. If you can read it carefully, he's really unbelievable. He's all in for his son. There's no hesitation to act. There's no hint of reservation. He has totally forgiven his son. And the most amazing thing, his son hasn't even had a chance to give his little speech asking for forgiveness. In fact, when he does get a chance to give the speech, he can't finish the speech. The, the father's excitement just drowns out the whole thing. He's come home. That's what, may, that's what matters. The kids come home. But in spite of all this wonderful, exciting drama, that's not where the focal point is in this story. The story focuses on someone else, and I'm certain you know this, but I remind you that this story focuses on the older brother. He is the reason Jesus told the story. 
That focal point is near the end of the story, and it's a downer. A solid joy runs through this whole story, it, but right at the end, it leaves a dark cloud on the horizon, and that is the attitude of the eldest son. It's in verse 28. It says, the father came out to the older brother and pleaded with him to come in and join the party, but we read the eldest son was angry and refused to go in. <clears throat> Jesus told the story in the presence of a group of people who were like that older brother. And for their sake, he told it. Jesus was painting for them a picture in words, a picture like Rembrandt has done in oils. In Rembrandt's painting, the young son has thrown himself at the father's feet. You can almost see the boy's body trembling. His clothes are like rags. His father's hands are upon him in the same way a shepherd would hold a lost sheep just found. And off to the side is the eldest son, aloof, detached, watching this passionate scene through cold, piercing, unfeeling, pride-filled eyes. That's who Jesus told the story to, the eldest son kind of people, the murmuring scribes and Pharisees, as described in verse 1 and 2 of this chapter. <clears throat> Outwardly, they appeared to be godly people, but inwardly, they were diametrically opposed to everything that's dear to the heart of God. Jesus wanted them to see themselves in this picture, how out of sync they were with the heart of God, and hoping, no doubt, for some to be convicted and have a change of heart. I said there were two things I felt need to be explained as we look at this passage, this parable. The second has to do with the emphasis on the father throughout the story. And it's true, the father is big in the story. The weight of the story is on the returning prodigal son. The focus of the story is on the stubborn elder son. But the star of the story is the father. That brings up a potential problem. For many people, no doubt, for some, and maybe some here this morning, their father is not the star of their story. Maybe quite the opposite. Sadly, he may even be their public enemy number one, top on the blacklist. For those people, the one word they would like dropped from the English language would be the word father. For them, the word father means rejection and abuse or betrayal or all of the above. For them, life with their father has been a horror show. Often few outside the home know that and just adds to the pain. They're hurt so deeply in their spirit, they're unable to use the word father in connection with God. And that's not just because they want to be gender inclusive. It's out of an involuntary contempt for anything to do with the word father. I sympathize with anyone who may feel that way. There was a time that I could not sympathize with that with that position, but many years as a pastor has caused me to see things differently. If we could live vicariously in the boots of someone who has been abused by their fathers in their growing up years, it would be much easier to understand. My father was not like that, but for a long time, I felt that he was. He was a gentleman, he was well respected in the community. He was a lawyer, a good lawyer. In the home, he was a disciplinarian. My older brother and I had our regular disagreements. Really a more accurate word would be fights. <laughs> On a regular basis, our mother would scream out, just wait till your father comes home. For me, that was enough said because I couldn't bear the thought of being scolded by my dad. My father was stern and strict. In the home, he set standards and enforced them. I did not like my father. As I think back, I don't remember ever being punished by my dad. I learned to acquiesce on the outside, even though I was rebelling on the inside. It's difficult to me to say, I had to think about this, to say the next four words I'm going to say. But they're the only words that accurately convey what I felt in relationship with my dad as I grew up. I hated my father. 
fast forward 20 years, I had married. My wife Mimi and I had three children. I had become a Presbyterian pastor. My relationship with my father had mellowed. He and I went hunting and fishing together when I was in town. And on occasion, we played golf together. And this brings me to a personal story that I guess you could call my Father's Day Confession. The story has its beginnings just down the road here at the Augusta Country Club golf course. It was just a golf game, but it changed my life. My family and I were on vacation from Florida where I served as an associate pastor in a large Presbyterian church. Mimi and I were visiting our parents in Augusta. My father invited me to join him in a golf game at the club. It was a pleasant summer day, and things went well for the first few holes. I say went well. I should say went normally. That is, my dad's pars and my double bogeys and worse. I've been a beginner golf my whole life, a beginner golfer the whole life, but I haven't yet given up. When I get over this knee surgery that I'm hobbling around with here, I'm going to go back at it and I'll still be a beginner. Well, about the fourth hole, my father began to offer help. Son, I think it would help if you stood a little closer to the ball. A few minutes later, he suggested I widen my stance. It was about then that I felt a hint of anger welling up deep inside. Take a slow backswing, son. My anger level began to rise, and so did my score. By the time he suggested I keep my head down, I was struggling with full-fledged anger. I began to be upset with myself more than with my dad. I found I could not calm my nerves. I was mad at my dad, and I couldn't help it. You're swinging too hard, son. You need to follow through. I lost track of the game. My father kept giving me advice, and every time he did, I flinched. I asked myself, why does my dad keep doing this? Doesn't he see how upset I am? And then I gave myself the answer. No, Sam, he doesn't know how upset you are. He's never known how you feel. You always kept that from him, just like you're doing now. By the time the golf game was over, I was living with anger. It's hard to hold that much anger in. My body actually began to shake. I couldn't see straight. You know, there are times when I'm so happy there are not 19 holes in the golf course, and usually that's because of my horrendous score, but not this time. I was really happy when that golf game was over, but I wasn't happy with myself. I was a Christian man. Years before, I had yielded my life to Jesus Christ, and I daily prayed that he would work out his life through me to his glory. I was very disappointed with myself. In addition, I was a pastor. I often consulted with others who sought the help in resolving their conflicts with other people. I had acquired skills to help people in their healing of relationships. But that day I felt helpless. Even prayer didn't seem to stop the waves of hostility that seemed to wave through my soul. Further, I was middle-aged. I had three kids and a teenager. And here I was with an attitude towards my father, worse than I could remember my children ever having towards me. In short, I was acting like a child. Something was bad wrong. I put it all on the back burner through the rest of our visit in Augusta. But back in Florida, after vacation, it was tops on my agenda. I was going to get to the bottom of my meltdown, no matter what it took. I made it a matter of prayer. I, I dared to tell God that I was open to whatever he wanted to show me. The epiphany came on my day off. I was on our back porch with a cold drink and a book, Maybe it was a magazine. I don't know what it was, but it was, it was unrelated to my problem. But nevertheless, my mind drifted to my dilemma with my dad. Obviously, I thought to myself, I need to forgive my dad. I've repressed my anger too long. It's beginning to surface. 
I had learned some things about anger, that unchecked anger does not dissipate with time. It's just like it happened yesterday. It only goes away with forgiveness. I had learned that part of my forgiving another does not include going back to that person and telling them you've forgiven them. 99% of the time, the other person will not think they've ever done anything wrong. No, so I knew it was up to me with God's help to forgive my dad. I also knew that repressed anger, anger held deep down inside where apparently mine was, can do all sorts of damage, not only emotionally and spiritually, but physically. And God's word is, re is replete with references against harboring anger in your heart. I could not afford to wait any longer. I had to figure out how to forgive my dad. Then it happened. It wasn't an audible voice from God, but it was very clear. Sam, forgiving your dad is not the problem. You need to ask your dad to forgive you. Wow. I think I said that out loud. Then I saw it all. That golf game was a microcosm of my life with my dad. My dad knew golf. He knew where I needed help. He wanted the best for me. My pride got in the way. The same in my growing up. My dad knew about life. He was a very wise man. He knew where I needed help. He wanted the best for me, but my pride kept me from receiving that help. Now my cover was totally blown. I could see how in my home growing up, I appeared to be going along with my dad. I had simply learned to behave outwardly like a good kid, but on the inside I was a rebel. I wore the colors, but I had never joined the team. Though chronologically I was the youngest in our family, I was nevertheless the consummate eldest son. I was like the stubborn son in the parable, the one who at the end of the day was really the one in the far country. He needed to come home. I needed, I needed to come home. I needed to ask my father's forgiveness. But how? How do you do that? I chose to write a letter, a difficult task, until I boiled it down to just one or, two, one or two sentences. I began the letter by explaining my feelings about the golf game and what it showed me about my growing up years with my dad. And then the important words, will you forgive me for always resisting your wise help? I was wrong, will you forgive me? Well, if writing the letter was difficult, mailing it was painful. After pushing it into a little slot in the mailbox, I immediately felt I'd, I'd done something terrible. I never had been straightforward with my dad. We talked sports and weather, or uh, anything that floats on the surface of life, but we never talked below the waterline, and this was going really deep. I felt that he would not understand it all, and what's more, he'd probably feel like I had really lost it. I began to wonder if fishing mail out of a mailbox was a misdemeanor or a felony. <laughs> but the deed was done. I waited, several days went by. I was anxious. How did my dad respond? Would he call, would he write? Would he do anything at all? Very late one afternoon, the phone rang. It was my dad. He said he had waited late to call after everybody had left the office so our conversation would be private. I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> then he said the most amazing thing. He said he had gotten our letter and it was the greatest letter he had ever received. Then came the words I'll never forget. He said, son, I forgive you. It's hard to convey what those words meant to me. It meant that he, had a, he agreed that I had wronged him, that he had sensed my resentful attitude and my resistance. He was acknowledging that he had been hurt by me, but he was erasing all that debt to him. You know, forgiveness is an undeserved gift. What a beautiful gift that was from my dad. His next words were surprising. 
He said, son, will you forgive me? I did push some things on you that I feel were not wise. Certainly, I said. And how easy that was to forgive him that little tiny bit in light of the huge debt against him that he had erased. At that moment, the wall came tumbling down. A whole new relationship with my dad began that day. And it still continues. When I have to make an important decision, I see his opinion first. Of course, <laughs> he's not with us anymore, but he left his ideals, his careful approach, his clear perspective, his deep insight, his wise judgment, and that's a lot to go on. But what a fool I was to miss out on all that live during my early years. I miss him a lot, I really do. Several months after my father died and the house was being sold, my brother and I sat together in a car in an old driveway, the driveway of the house where we grew up on Hillcrest Avenue. My brother was the executor of our father's estate. <clears throat> he wanted to share with me the contents of my father's bank lockbox. The contents were sparse but valuable. There were two or three important legal documents there were a couple of distinguished looking writing pens, a very valuable gold watch, and a pocket watch of more value sentimentally than the gold watch. We divided, we divided it all up equally. And then my brother said, oh yes, here's one last thing. I was going to toss this, Sam, but I, I think maybe you should look at it before I do. He handed it to me. It was a letter postmark, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It was a letter I had sent my dad over 20 years before. It's now in my lockbox. Now, it's, a, it's not a well-written letter, but it's golden. I'm sure you know why I've told this story about me. It's because I want to encourage anyone here today who may find themselves in any situation like this to write that golden letter to your dad, to your mom, your uncle, your colleague, a friend. It may be only one person, but it can be the source of great blessings for many and life-changing for you. Well, there's an even higher reason I've told my story. I, it has to do with the good news in the story Jesus told. And I'm not speaking of the good news I've seen in the Father's love poured out upon that young repentant uh, prodigal. As wonderful as that was, I'm speaking of the Father's love for the unrepentant son, the elder son. We're told the father came out into the field and pleaded with the older son to come in and join the celebration. Some translations use the word entreat. There's a, there's a world of meaning in that little word, plead or entreat. In the original Greek, it's from a root word used in other places in the New Testament for the Holy Spirit. The word is paraclete. It means comforter, helper, counselor, one who stands alongside. I'm so thankful that God didn't give up on me, that he stood alongside me and encouraged me to come to his celebration. And I'm not speaking now about my reconciliation with my earthly father. I'm speaking about my reconciliation with my heavenly father. The elder son complex has always been with me. And like all of us, I'm a work in progress and I always will be. Early on, when I yielded my life to Christ, I could not identify with the prodigal son. I didn't come home from a far country. I came home from the position of the elder son. Though I wore the colors of the Christian faith, I had never joined the team. But God loved me and stood alongside me. I could not resist his invitation. I gave in. There is one moment in the younger son's experience that I do identify with. The day I opened my life to Jesus, he didn't give me time to say anything, my little speech or anything. He just came rushing in. I had come home, and that was all that mattered. 
You know, there may be someone here today who has been wearing the colors of the Christian faith for a long time, but has never joined the team. Please know that God stands by you. He loves you with lavish, extravagant love. May he give you grace today to come home and join in with all who celebrate that great love of God's. You don't have to make a speech. You just have to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in your still small voice of calm, assure us, each one of us, of your great love. And give us grace to live in simple trust in you, that we may experience the beauty of your peace as we seek to love others, even as you love us. In Jesus' name we make our prayer. Amen. Please stand and let us say together what we believe.